Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Workforce Wednesday of the 2021-2022 school year with the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce Workforce Center's Bus to Business Virtual Program Series. My name is Zach Gobert, and I'm a project manager with the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and I help to direct our Bus to Business program. I would like to take a minute to thank our sponsors, the Kentucky Society for Human Resource Management and, KY, and KCTCS for their investment in helping to bring classrooms to careers. In addition to our virtual live sessions, weekly e-news, and critical jobs of the week graphics, this year we have launched a contest for students in grades K through five to participate in throughout the school year. Students in kindergarten through fifth grade are invited to download or request a printed copy of our newly released Bus to Business coloring book. This coloring book highlights critical Kentucky jobs in different industries, including construction, healthcare, equine, and manufacturing. Each month, students will be invited to submit their completed coloring pages online, and selected winners will be featured on social media and on the Bus to Business website. For the month of April, please color the healthcare page found on page five and submit your entry found on the Bus to Business website. All of this information, including links to turn in submissions, can be found at kychamber.com slash bus to business. For this webinar, closed captioning has been enabled, so please use the Zoom bar on your screen to enable this feature if you need it. Today's session is also being recorded as well as live streamed to YouTube and will be available to rewatch and share afterwards. Whether you're over one of the 200 students tuning in with us live on April 27th or watching at a later date, thank you so much for joining. I hope you all learned something new. Today we'll be hearing from the UK Markey Cancer Center. The UK Markey Cancer Center was first designated by the National Cancer Institute in 2013, a distinction that recognizes its extraordinary ability to provide world-class care for its patients. They're the only NCI designated cancer center in Kentucky. I will now pass it over to Aaron with the UK Markey Cancer Center for today's session. Thanks all. Okay, um, thank you, Zach. I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about the cancer research and training opportunities at the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center. So before we get started um, in talking about the Cancer Center, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to where I am. So I grew up in Trick County, Kentucky. I was born and um, raised in Kentucky. I grew up in Trick County, which is in the Western part of the state um, near Land Between the Lakes, if that's familiar to any of you all. I attended Center College um, in Danville, Kentucky for undergrad where I majored in biology and minored in biochemistry and molecular biology. After I graduated from Center, I did research for a year at the University of Mississippi Medical School. I decided that I liked being in the lab and doing research. So I decided to go to graduate school. I chose UK and I studied hematopoietic stem cells and how they're involved in the aging process while I was there. I received a doctorate in physiology and then did research on and off for several years before transitioning into my current position at the Markey Cancer Center. I think really I decided that I liked working with graduate students um, and trainees more than mice and fish. Um, so now I get to help run our educational activities and manage our education programs at the Cancer Center. And I get to do fun things like talk to you all about cancer research. So the mission of our Cancer Center is to reduce the burden of cancer with a focus on Kentucky and its most vulnerable populations through research, prevention, treatment, education, and community engagement. So the Markey Cancer Center has been serving the Commonwealth of Kentucky for over 40 years, starting in 1975 with the creation of the McDowell Cancer Network as an important community outreach and education program. The Markey Cancer Center was officially established in 1983 with a large donation from Lucille Markey, who was the owner of Calumet Farm in Lexington, and the first Markey building was dedicated in 1986. Sorry. In 1990, the Kentucky Cancer Registry was established within the Markey Cancer Center as a statewide population-based cancer surveillance program and in 2005, Markey Forever changed the face of breast cancer therapy with findings published by Dr. Ed Ramond, who discovered a highly effective therapy for women with HER2 positive breast cancer. Our current director, Dr. Evers, was recruited in 2009, and we first received the National Cancer, Stu cancer Institute designation that Zach mentioned in 2013. Our designation was renewed in 2018 for an additional five years 
in the Market Cancer Center has been listed in the U.S. News and World Report's top 50 cancer centers for the last three years with our most recent ranking of 33, which reflects our growing reputation. As the only NCI designated cancer center in the state, the Markey Cancer Center embraces the entire Commonwealth of Kentucky with a population of over 4.4 million as its catchment area. 98% of our patients are Kentucky residents. 91% are from the central and eastern region of the state and 7% are from the remainder of the state. So you may be asking yourself why I'm talking to, to you today about cancer education and why cancer education is important. Well, it's really because there's a huge burden of cancer in, in Kentucky. Kentucky is a top five state in incidence or mortality for lung, colorectal, head and neck, cervical and melanoma cancers. There are Kentucky specific risk factors such as tobacco, obesity, there are environmental exposures and viral infections. And there's a, um, there are cancer disparities um, that exist within our state. We have geographical disparities. 16% of our population um, lives in poverty. We have racial and ethnic disparities. And we also have access to screening issues in our state. So cancer education is not only important because we need to train the clinicians that treat the disease, but we also need to train the scientists and the researchers that help develop treatments and therapies for the disease. And this is particularly important in our state. So at Cancer Era, at the Markey Cancer Center, we have a well-established cancer research training pipeline. I help guide this endeavor spanning elementary to the postdoctoral level. Our program has reached almost 1,700 students and trainees over the last five years, despite COVID-related setbacks over the last two years. Several of our training programs are listed here, and I will expand a little on those that are in red. So one of our newest programs is the Summer Health Research Experience, or SHE in Oncology program, which began last summer in 2021. UK was among five universities to receive an American Cancer Society funding for a two week long virtual program that, that engaged 19 females from high schools across Kentucky. Lectures and panel discussions were all led by female cancer researchers and leaders. 87% of Markey senior leaders are women, and this program represents our effort to continue to, to develop the pipeline of our female leaders. Career enhancement is vital for our underserved area of Appalachia, which ranks among the lowest levels of awarded advanced degrees. So to, to address this disparity, we have developed a program that provides students from Appalachia with a mentored cancer research training experience. This program is called ACTION, which stands for Appalachian Career Training in Oncology. So far, ACTION students have been very successful. They've co-authored 16 peer-reviewed publications and two editions of a book entitled The Cancer Crisis and Appalachia Kentucky Students Take Action. 17 of our undergraduate alumni are now in medical school. One student is in graduate school pursuing a PhD in cancer biology, three are in pharmacy school, three are in a physician assistance program, and one is in a master's of public health program. Um, this program is, is wonderful. We've trained so far 88 students from Appalachia, and the students engage in research, education, um, clinical shadowing activities, and also outreach activities with their home um, counties. They take what they learn here and they take it back to their communities. Another one of our newer programs is the Markey Strong Scholars Program, which is also funded by the American Cancer Society. Strong stands for Markey Science Training in Research Oncology Networking and Professional Growth. This 10-week summer program provides career and professional development for undergraduates inter interested in cancer research who are from underserved or underrepresented backgrounds. The objective of this program is to, to, to build a diverse pipeline of confident cancer researchers and future oncology prof professionals. Um, it's a mentored, personalized mentored research experience. Um, we aim to increase their knowledge of cancer. We talk about health disparities and also increase their knowledge of experimental design and lab work. And we also want to foster critical thinking and build resiliency for future endeavors for these individuals. 
last year in the summer of 2021, it was our inaugural program. We hosted eight scholars and this year for the summer of 2022, when we've been able to expand that to 19 scholars. So at the core of our um, educational endeavors to train the next generation of cancer researchers is a dedication to graduate and postdoctoral education. So we have basic clinical, community, and bioinformatics research opportunities at the Markey Cancer Center. We have over 200 Markey Cancer Center members who are willing to provide personalized mentorship and research training experiences for trainees at all levels. Um, beginning with high school through the postdoctoral level. We have a very supportive training environment that fosters diversity and values training input. So these are just a few examples of our trainees in action. Um, here's one with giving a poster presentation. Uh, we do outreach activities together. Um, this one at the bottom left, we, um, we cook dinner for the Hope Lodge, um, which um, houses uh, cancer patients and their or cancer families of patients who stay in the Markey Cancer Center. Uh, this is one of our graduate students with our cancer center director, Dr. Evers, who is very supportive of our educational efforts and um, at the cancer center. And these are some of our action students at a um, uh, at halftime at a UK football game. They were recognized for the work that they that they are doing. So the ultimate goal of cancer research is to advance knowledge and to improve patient care. And so accordingly, Markey has developed a series of meetings and symposia that disseminate this cutting edge um, research to all stakeholders. These events include our annual Markey Cancer Center Research Day, which is open to the public and is coming up um, in May. Um, this day highlights our accomplishments over the past year, and we have multiple other meetings as well. All of our trainees are encouraged to attend the meetings to increase their knowledge, relate their projects to clinical care, and also address the issues face facing uh, cancer patients. So these are a few examples or pictures of our trainees with their posters and all the research that, they, that they've done. And so they show it off and they um, communicate their science to the public and to other researchers. So that was a quick introduction to the Cancer Center and our educational programs. Um, I'm gonna now pass it over to a couple of our trainees who do research here at the Cancer Center. The first one is Lauren Hudson. She's an undergraduate student who has been doing research here for several years. So she's gonna talk to us about her, her research and also her plans for the future. And then we're gonna hear from Sumathi Hassani who is a graduate student at the Cancer Center. And we're gonna also hear about what she does and her plans for the future. All right, hi everyone. Um, it's really, really amazing to be here today to talk to you guys. I love talking to upcoming students, um, so I'm really excited to be here. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about my path to research at UK and the Marquee Cancer Center, um, kind of how I got interested and dive in a little bit um, about my research and what I do with Dr. Vanderford in the Cancer Center. So just a little introduction about me. I'm originally from Northern Kentucky, moved down to Lexington my freshman year of college. Um, currently I am a senior at UK. I'm studying neuroscience and biology. I have a Spanish minor also. So I'm really passionate about those topics. I have been participating in undergraduate research for three years. So I got into research during spring of my freshman year and I have continued it up until this point. When I'm not in school or doing research, um, I enjoy reading, um, particularly a lot of fantasy novels, if you're interested in those, writing, uh, going to the gym, and spending time with my amazing roommates. So my path to research was different from a lot of students. I wasn't initially interested. When I came to the University of Kentucky, I thought that the only research available was bench research. So where you're in a lab pipetting things into a Petri dish, I had never really enjoyed that in high school. And so I thought that I wasn't interested in research in college, 
but I soon realized that there's a lot of research that's not completed at the bench. So this is a picture of me doing my research. So this is what my research looks like. It's a lot of finding similar literature, um, analyzing data that we've collected from students. So it's not sitting at a bench pipetting um, microbes into a petri dish, which is exactly what I wanted. As I mentioned, I began working with Dr. Vanderford about three years ago. Since then, I have been published on nine scientific journal articles, and I was the first author on four of them, which is really exciting. I love getting to share my research with others. And it allowed me to discover a previously unknown passion. When I came to the University of Kentucky, I didn't really know a lot about cancer in Kentucky or cancer in rural Appalachia, Kentucky. But now that I've participated in this research for three years, I'm really passionate about it. And I plan to continue working on this research um, into medical school and into my future beyond medical school. So I'm going to jump into the focus of my research just a little bit. As Erin mentioned, Kentucky has a really high cancer burden. It ranks first in the nation in overall cancer incidence and mortality with about 26,000 new cases each year. One thing that really shocked me was that the Eastern Appalachian region of the state is hit particularly hard. The Appalachian residents are 8% more likely to die from a preventable cancer tumor or malignancy than their urban counterparts. So one of the first questions I had as a new undergrad was, well, why, why is this? Why are Appalachian residents so much more likely to be affected by cancer? So one of the main factors is smoking. There's an economic dependence on tobacco in the region, which lead to really, leads to really high rates of smoking. As Erin also mentioned, there's high rates of poverty, um, which often leads to a decreased access to healthy foods and poor life decisions. Um, initially, additionally, there is low health care access. Often members of the Appalachian region have to drive three plus hours to the nearest cancer care facility, which is oftentimes in Lexington. So if you have, have to drive three plus hours, this often leads to low health care engagements. I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't want to drive three hours to a doctor's appointment you know, once a month also. So this leads to a decreased amount of cancer preventative screenings. Finally, there are really low education levels in Appalachia, Kentucky. Kentucky ranks 47th in the nation for educational attainment, and this is what our research specifically wanted to target. So before jumping into some of the results of our research, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the action program, which Erin kind of breezed over, um, but this is my passion. I work with a lot of the action students. As she mentioned, the action program gives Appalachian Kentucky students the opportunity to gain cancer research, outreach, and clinical experiences. One of my favorite things about this is that our action Action students actually get to go shadow um, physicians, both in the outpatient setting um, and a clinical setting, which is really awesome, a great experience for anyone interested in medical school. Um, as she mentioned, it's high school students and undergraduates. And although I'm not an Appalachian student myself, I became really passionate about this program, and I was eager to learn what I could do as a Kentucky native to increase cancer literacy. So some of the results and methods of my research, in order to increase cancer literacy in students, we traveled to six schools located in Eastern and Central Kentucky. They're listed here on this map. The black line denotes uh, the Appalachian region. So five were in the Eastern Appalachian portion of the state and one was just across that line in the central portion. So when we arrived at the schools, we first gave students a baseline cancer literacy pretest. So this was 10 quick questions just to gauge what they know about cancer biology, cancer risk factors, and cancer in Kentucky. We then gave them a 30 to 40 minute cancer related presentation. So this covered those same topics, cancer biology, risk factors, cancer in Kentucky. And then we gave them a post test that this was exactly the same as the pretest. Uh, 10 questions just to gauge what they learned from the initial cancer-related presentation. And then three months after, we gave them a follow-up survey that had those same 10 questions plus a few more to gauge how they retained this information in the long term. 
So the, our results were really, really promising. Um, we found there was a significant improvement in the number of correct responses from pre-test to post-test. So this pre-test is here in blue. The average correct response was 50%. So that's a failing grade. No one wants that. But in the post-test, it was increased to 77%. And then it remained elevated at the three month follow up survey at about 75%. So we are really excited about this because it showed that educational cancer literacy not only improves in the short term, but also is retained over a long period of time as a result of a brief intervention. So in the three month follow up survey, we also asked these three questions. The most important one here is C. So we asked on a scale of one to 10, one being the least likely, 10 being the most likely, rate how likely you are to encourage a friend or family member to change their habits. The median score was an eight. So we were really, really excited about this because it showed that not only were students willing to learn about cancer from this presentation, but then they were willing to go home and share this information with their friends, their family members, their church members, community members, and they were excited to act as agents of change in their community to decrease cancer risk in Appalachia, Kentucky. But we quickly realized that one 30 to 40 minute cancer related intervention isn't enough. It's not gonna decrease cancer in Appalachia, Kentucky. We quickly realized that we needed more. So we began to develop cancer curriculum that could be integrated into schools. So we did some research. We had never created a curriculum before, so we needed to learn what makes a good curriculum. We first learned that it needs to be culturally tailored. So for Appalachia, Kentucky, this looks like being aware of specific cultural considerations, such as the economic dependence on tobacco or a distrust of outsiders. Second, it needs to be ongoing, meaning one time learning this information is not enough. It needs to be multiple days sitting in the classroom learning about this material. It also needs to be geared towards an impressionable population. So for us, this looks like our middle schoolers and our high schoolers, you guys. You guys are at a time in your lives when you're making decisions that can impact your future. If you decide to smoke, if you decide to start drinking alcohol at this point in time, it can influence your future decisions. So by gearing it towards a population such as this, we believe we have the chance to make the greatest impact. So just briefly to talk about our components, uh, it's a three-part curriculum designed to be taught in three to four class periods. The first covers cancer basics. So this is where you learn kind of how does the cell divide and how does this division contribute to cancer? Lesson two, you learn about risk factors and modifiable behaviors. So what makes it more likely for someone to develop cancer and what can you do to decrease your risk? And then the third talks about cancer treatments, both those that are more common and those that are novel. Each lesson comes equipped with a PowerPoint and a teacher's guide to help teachers um, instruct their students on the material. So enough about my research, what am I doing next? So as many students who participated in the action program, I am going on to professional school. I am attending UK College of Medicine, graduating in 2026. I hope to be an oncologist um, after medical school. And the best thing about going to the University of Kentucky for med school is that I get to continue my research with the Cancer Center and Dr. Vanderford. Ultimately, we're hoping to implement this cancer curriculum into more Appalachian schools in hopes that we will educate students, increase cancer literacy, and decrease their cancer risk. So if you have any questions about the information or the curriculum or for me, here is my contact information and a list of some amazing people who supported us throughout research. And that is all I have for you guys. Um, I am ready to pass it over. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me try and uh, share my screen here. Ooh. One second. Sorry about that. I am actually having some technical difficulties. Let's 
see. There we go. Also, go ahead and put my video on. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, we can see it perfect. It's not in presentation view right now, then. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if I can turn, start my video as well. There we go. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? I hope you guys are enjoying all of our exciting talks and are really thinking about maybe joining um, some of these cancer focused careers. So uh, my name is Samathi Hassani. I am a fourth year graduate student in Dr. Tinian Gao's lab. And I have had quite a bit of an interesting journey to get to where I am. And so I kind of wanted to share that with you all and share with you that there are many different types of careers um, that are associated with biology. So we'll be exploring some careers in both academic settings as well as in the biotech industry today. So a little bit more about myself. My name is Samathi Asani. Like I mentioned, I am a fourth year PhD candidate. I'm here at UK and I get to be involved in various different activities um, while I'm here. So alongside being a researcher, I also am a mentor to a lot of these programs that Aaron had mentioned earlier, for example, Strong Action, um, as well as some high school programs for local high schoolers here um, in Lexington. I'm also a very well involved member of like diversity and equity councils on campus. And I really like to focus on um, trainee advising and how to make trainee health and wellness better um, at our school. So how did I get here? <laughs> it's a long story. I actually am not a Kentucky native. I am from California and I did my undergraduate research at the University of California at Davis. Um, while I was there, I really wanted to initially go into medical school, but I started doing research um, in Dr. Rose's lab and I worked with C. elegans. So if anyone knows what that is, it's a model organism that is a worm that's transparent. It was really cool. Um, and when I delved into research, I was very surprised by how much I enjoyed it and I wanted to pursue a career further. So I worked then at a company by the name of Novazymes. Um, I'm sure many of you might have heard of Nova Nordisk. It's the, I guess, the healthcare older sister of Novazymes. Um, and in Novazymes, I got to work on biofuels. So it's an aspect of biotech that a lot of people don't focus on, which is biofuel substrates and just um, enzymes that can be found in daily useful um, items. For example, like when you wash clothes and, and do your laundry, Tide has a lot of enzymes that can help you break down oils and fats and lipids that are on your t-shirt after you ate. So um, it's, it was a really exciting experience. I got to uh, walk out with some really nice molecular biology experience, but I realized that even though I really enjoyed the work, I kind of missed the translational aspect and I missed the medical aspect um, of what I learned in school. So I actually went back to school again um, and I got my master's at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And that's when I got to do an inter internship that was more focused on cancer and my curricular was also more focused on cancer. Um, and I, I basically got to realize that cancer biology is something I'm really interested in. Um, so I took that one step further and I went back into the biotech industry, but this time I went into the pharma side. Um, so I worked for a company called MedImmune, which is now um, has been dissolved into the parent company AstraZeneca. And I'm sure some of you guys might have heard of that company because of the recent news and their um, attempts at making a vaccine for COVID. I got to work on a really cool cancer therapy while I was there. And now that cancer therapy is in phase two trials and is fast hacked for phase three, which is really exciting. Um, but what I learned in industry is that, you know, in order to make really good therapies to help patients, you have to know a lot more background science. And so that's what triggered me to come back um, to do my PhD. And so that's what led me to here. And so now I'm at UK, I'm at the Markey Cancer Center, and I'm really enjoying my work here. 
So why, after all of this traveling around the world and the country, why did I come to Marquee Cancer Center? Well, the main thing is that there is an amazing collaboration between clinic clinicians and researchers here. I have really enjoyed how researchers and clinicians talk to one another about patient cases, and they really make it um, well known that both diagnosis of a cancer as well as the research that follows to understand that cancer better, it's a very strong combination to help patients. The second thing I really enjoyed was the excellent research opportunities. So, so there are many labs that are incorporated in the Markey Cancer Center and they belong to various different departments in the College of Medicine. So there are people who are obviously in the Department of Toxicology and Cancer Biology who um, have labs there and you can join that department, but I am actually in the Department of Biochemistry. So that lets me better understand the cellular purpose or the cellular mechanisms that drive cancer. The third thing is that I really liked the fact that Markey Cancer Center is so patient focused. Um, as Lauren mentioned, many patients come from the Eastern Appalachian region in Kentucky. And so we are able to work with these patients to better understand how to teach them about cancer, how to diagnose them and how to really um, help them better their health in general. And then lastly, um, I really like the fact that Markey Cancer Center highlights its bench to bedside mission. So what that means is basically working on the cancer um, in the lab, on the bench, understanding some of the mechanisms and really using that to, um, to make therapies and to come up with therapeutic regimes that can help a patient on the bed. Um, and so I think that personalized medicine is incredibly important. And I think that's one of the main initiatives that Markey Cancer Center has. So what do I work on? Um, I specifically work on colorectal cancer. And so colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States. Uh, it, and it is actually found to be number one in Kentucky, which is a huge problem. Um, about one in 20 individuals is at risk to develop colon cancer at some point in their life. And that actually increases with age. So 90% of cases in individuals aged 50 years or older have a chance um, of gaining colon cancer. So many of 90% of the cases of colon cancer in general happen at the age of 50 or older. But there's ways to mitigate risk um, for colon cancer. And so um, Lauren really nicely talked about how Kentucky is known to be one of the most cancer prevalent states in the United States. And there's various reasons for that. You know, there's a high smoking population here. Um, there's a high obesity problem here. And interestingly enough, um, one of the best ways to reduce risk of colon cancer is by reducing these three main aspects of um, wellness and lifestyle. So that's, you know, maintaining your diet, your exercise, as well as your BMI. So what that means is that colon cancer is actually very closely related to obesity. And that's something that I get to study in the lab. So just kind of a quick schematic that what I work on is basically how colon cancer cells can interact with fat. Um, Interestingly enough, when a tumor is growing, they interact with neighboring tissues and um, adipose tissue, which is also known as fat tissue, can release uh, fatty acids. And these fatty acids can actually be eaten up by our cells and cause various changes in cellular metabolism as well as signaling. And so um, my studies have shown that increase in fat surrounding your tumor cells um, allow for an increase in fatty acid uptake by these cancer cells. So once again, this definitely means fats that are consumed by eating all those hamburgers and pizza and all that good, yummy, tasty food. It's that contributes to your adipose tissue. Um, the cancer cells can really benefit from that. And then that's what causes these cancer cells to kind of grow uncontrollably. So we actually see that that Increase in fatty acid uptake can change the metabolism within the cell to allow for fatty acid oxidation to occur. So that means breakdown of those fats um, and that can influence 
different signaling pathways found in colon cancer. So colon cancer is driven by signaling that is known as Wnt signaling. So it's um, basically a pathway that allows for increased proliferation um, in cancer cells. And so if you have a lot of fats around those tissues, you're actually enhancing that signaling pathway and allowing for cells to grow completely uncontrollably, which in fact is cancer. Um, and so while I'm in the lab, I get to work on some of the coolest things. So here on the top right uh, left, you can see that actually I have fluorescently labeled cells. I know, isn't that nuts? Um, so I get to actually label mitochondria, as you can see here with GFP, and I get to label fat molecules with RFP. So this red, these red dots, and you can see that over a period of time, the red dots are able to basically converge and localize to the mitochondria and essentially allow them to explode. Um, and so that's actually seen with this yellow coloration. That means that the mitochondria and the fat molecules are co-localizing and causing changes in mitochondrial structure, which is really cool. I also get the opportunity to work with an in vivo model. So here I have a mouse model that has a xenograft tumor. So a xenograft tumor is basically a tumor that sits on the, on the periphery and the skin of the mice. And so you can see here, look at that huge tumor on that mouse. And we get to do a lot of analysis on these um, in vivo animal models. And the third and last thing that is so cool and unique to my lab is that we get to look at mini um, organoid structures in 3D. So what does that mean? That means that basically I can take intestinal tissue from the mouse, kind of grind it up and grow 3D mini intestines in like a dish, which is insane. So here you can see um, some of these cool, small intestinal structures. And these are aspects of science that I had never had the opportunity to work with before. So it's super exciting um, to get to play with different types of technology to really understand how cancer is working in the intestine and in the colon. So there are things about Markey Cancer Center that I believe have really prepared me to do um, what I wanna do next. And so that comes kind of in the soft skills that I've been able to develop outside of the lab as well. So while I got some really cool experience on the techniques that I've learned um, and how to apply them in cancer research. I also have an amazing ability to work with other people. And that's something that's fostered by Marquee Cancer Center. So here on the top left, I have a picture of some of my core lab members. Um, Dr. Gao is my mentor and she has been incredible and she is so supportive. And what I love about Marquee Cancer Center is that leaders like this really support the trainees um, and training learning. As a result, I have also been able to put on the hat and be a mentor to many um, undergraduate and high school students. So here is my undergraduate, De uh, Daniela. She was in the STRONG program and I got to work with her on a really nice poster um, where she was able to talk about the work that we were doing in our lab. I am also very much an action mentor. So these are my high school students from an action program that was pre-COVID. Um, and I'm really excited to say that um, I just recently learned that my student, Zach, is going to Harvard in the fall um, as an undergraduate. And so it's really nice to see that your students move forward to do big and amazing things. Um, and they get to really experience some of that wet lab experience with you um, while they're here in the summer. I also have made incredible friends while I'm here, while I've been here, as you all know, I am not a Kentucky native. So coming here, I met all of these new people and uh, Markey Cancer Center trainees are really like a community and we really support one another. And so my friends took me to my first ever UK football game, which was really exciting. And and, and we won, so it was really fun. Um, I get to have brunch on the weekends with some of my other trainee friends. And here we actually have a picture um, of some of us trainees at the biochemistry department retreat. We were able to go on a hike while we were on the retreat and we basically just got soaked. Um, so 
what I'm trying to say here is that while Marquee Cancer Center develops you as a student and really develops your technical skills, it also really helps develop your people skills. And I've learned to collaborate with various different professors on some of the projects that I'm working on. And I've also learned to be a very effective mentor to others so that they can go on and be the next generation to combat some of these exciting um, scientific topics. So what do I plan to do post-graduation? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I am excited to lead a research laboratory and to be a principal investigator like um, my professor. However, focus mostly on the interaction between academia and industry. So I have been um, very lucky to have opportunities where I've worked in both sectors. Um, and in industry, I was really more therapeutic focused and trying to really get therapies to patients. And in academia, I was, I took a step back and I really learned about what aspects of um, cancer metabolism and tumor growth are important to understand so that we can make these therapies. And I do think that the interaction and the crosstalk between both academia and industry is incredibly important to help patients um, get the treatments that they need. So hopefully I can um, do that in the future. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you to all of you guys for coming out and um, showing your interest in understanding what science forward careers look like. If you have any questions regarding the research that I do in, um, at UK at the Marquee Cancer Center, or if you have questions about what type of careers um, you would like to see um, for yourself in industry and academia, please feel free to reach out. So um, yeah. And with that, I'll pass it forward. Awesome. Thank you guys so much from the UK Marquee Cancer Center team. This has been fantastic. And I hope that all of our students tuning in today were able to learn something more. And if you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. I'm now going to pass it over to Mike and Audrey from KCTCS to learn more about their programs. Hello. Uh, my name is Audrey Law. And I am a uh, biology faculty at the Bluegrass Community and Technical College and the coordinator for the biotechnology program at BCTC. Um, going, and thank you. Uh, that was some uh, fascinating research uh, that we just heard about. And so I hope I can further interest you if you are interested in a career in, in research, either in the biomedical field or uh, in many, many different directions that you can take uh, biotechnology skills. Um, I will tell you a bit more about BCTC's program. And hopefully, can everyone see my screen there? Yep, we can see it perfect. All right, thank you. So um, I do want to, uh, introduce myself a little bit further before I go on about the biotechnology program. Um, I grew up in Kentucky in Louisville, and I was a graduate of the University of Kentucky's um, agriculture biotechnology program, which is now the agriculture and medical biotechnology program, uh, which is a, a wonderful program to start uh, your research career with, but I will talk more about that in a minute. Uh, I continued, I got my PhD at UK in the College of Agriculture, Plant and Soil Science. And I got to uh, participate in some really fascinating research um, concerning microbiomes. So you may have heard about microbiomes, um, the human gut and how that relates to human health. We're learning so much about that. Um, but there is also a lot going on between plants and soils and their microbiomes and how that relates to plant health and crop health and sustainability and environmental quality. So I got to participate in some really awesome research there. Uh, but just recently, uh, in fact, starting this January, I accepted the position at um, BCTC and uh, took over the, uh, the coordinator position for the biotechnology program. And it is a really wonderful opportunity that I think uh, not enough people know about. So I will, 
Uh, let's see. There we go. So this is a video that um, is from the website, and I'm going to put it on mute because we don't need to hear the background music. But these are our students in our lab. We have a wonderful lab that is uh, really well equipped to teach all the basics and advanced techniques that you need for research, for biomedical research, for bio uh, biofuels, um, agricultural biotechnology. Uh, we learn it all in a very small, intimate setting. Our maximum class is 12. So you really get a chance to um, be familiar with these techniques. And we talk a lot about transferable skills. And so the, the skills that you learn in the lab, and we spend a lot of time in the lab, this is a very laboratory intensive program. Um, and anything from uh, cloning and sequencing used in, in agricultural biotechnology, uh, biomanufacturing, biopharmaceuticals, uh, biomedical research, all of those skills that you learn can be transferred into so many different directions. And so that's why it, it can be a little bit difficult to answer the question, you know, what, what is biotechnology? What can I do with a biotechnology um, associate's degree from BCTC? Um, it really is um, a very, very uh, wide open opportunity for any, any student who's interested in uh, any type of, of research and a lot of different directions that you can, can go from there. Um, I think uh, we, we heard before about how important bioinformatics is to research and uh, especially um, modern research going forward. We have the ability to generate massive amounts of data, especially with uh, genome research and um, in particular microbiome research as well. Um, we need people who understand the computer science, the analysis, as well as the biology. And so um, anyone interested in, in computer computational biology, bioinformatics, um, we definitely need those skills as well as laboratory skills. And um, that also opens up a lot of a lot of opportunities. So we offer some bioinformatics courses at BCTC um, that integrate some of the modern bioinformatics that, um, that we're using today in, in research in all different areas. And so that is going to be very important going into the future, people who understand um, the computational biology behind all this research. And I like to show this slide because it's a general, I, uh, a collage of what people think when they think of uh, biotechnology or uh, you know, gene editing uh, is the big topic now that uh, we can do so much with what we know um, in the human genome and especially in the biomedical fields. So this is a good way to visualize the possibilities, but um, the, the work of Biotechnology often happens in the lab uh, in conjunction with um, a lot of computational biology and bioinformatics. And so those core lab skills is really what we strive to, um, to offer here. We have a unique opportunity to uh, not only in our coursework, but opportunities for independent research and um, internships with local biotechnology companies and also partnerships with UK and other institutions. Um, this is an example from a, a bio uh, manufacturing standpoint, just to point out all the different aspects of biotechnology that go into uh, research for, uh, in this example, this is a more efficient and sustainable method of producing acetone and isopropanol. Uh, and you can see uh, genome mining, uh, enzyme engineering, uh, bioinformatics, cell culture and optimization, um, biofermentation. Um, all of these core skills um, are integrated into our program. So I, I really feel like we offer a, a, 
a very strong um, set of valuable skills that you can go forward either uh, furthering your education or even going to work right away in a variety of uh, companies and fields, whether it's research, uh, lab technicians, research assistants. Uh, we have a lot of biotechnology startup companies here in Lexington, and many of them have uh, relationships with us. They know about uh, the biotech program at BCTC, and they know what our students learn and, and that they will be ready uh, and familiar with the techniques they need in the lab. Uh, so all tech, catalant, uh, diagnostics, um, the, uh, the fermentation, uh, distillery industry, all of, all of those different um, directions you can go that really need and rely upon skilled uh, lab, people with laboratory skills that they can apply right away. Um, but if uh, you want to move forward with your education, many of our students transfer to uh, UK in the Agriculture and Medical Biotechnology Program, for example, which I'm well familiar with, um, even though it's a while since I was a graduate there. Um, also the medical laboratory sciences uh, bachelor's degree is one that our students have uh, very successfully transferred into and did very well as they showed up with um, all of those lab skills that they could apply right away, um, as well as some transfer credits and um, a little bit of, um, ahead of the curriculum with some of those core classes taken at BCTC. So those are two very, very good options for anyone who's interested in uh, starting at BCTC and transferring uh, those skills on to further their education. Um, and just briefly, I want to share with you um, a little bit about what you can expect. Uh, we do offer several certificates that you can obtain in conjunction with uh, another associate's degree. And we offer a, a full associate's degree in um, as a the biotechnology laboratory technician associates. And so the, the courses that um, are required are core uh, biotechnology techniques and um, nucleic acids, and uh, those are all very intense laboratory courses. You spend a lot of time uh, really perfecting a lot of techniques that are valuable skills in, um, in research or in any number of um, applications. And we offer a very a wide variety of electives that you can really tailor the direction that you want to go if you are more interested in bioinformatics, um, if you really are, uh, you know, you want to go towards the biomedical side of things or um, the biomanufacturing side of things, we can, we can make it to fit your goals, um, your career goals and your education goals. And it's a, a great program here. And so if any one has further questions, the BCTC um, website, sorry, let me bring that up here, is where you can put in your information and that information will go to me. Um, and I will be more than happy to talk to you about uh, what we offer here and further information about the program. So um, I will also put my email in the chat. But thank you very much. That's all I have. And I will be happy to stick around and answer questions later as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Audrey. And thanks again to the UK Market Cancer Center and KCTCS for being such a great sponsor of our Bust to Business program. I want to thank you all for tuning in with us live today. And we will be back next week, May 4th, with Next Air to Energy to learn more about careers in sustainable energy. And Mike, I, uh, I apologize, I think I missed you there. Do you have a couple uh, slides as well? I do. Awesome, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike real quick. Okay, can you see my screen? <clears throat> Not just yet. Okay.
How about now? Uh, no, it's not sharing. Try clicking the green arrow. Yeah, I did the, sh the screen share. <clears throat> Let me try this again. Sorry about the technical difficulty there. No worries. Yeah, when I'm doing a screen share, I'm getting, uh, let me try again. Okay. There we go. Okay. Do, do, do. Okay, are you seeing the title slide up? Yep, it's not in a presentation view, but we can see the slide. Okay, let me get it in. Perfect. I think you're muted, however. There we go. Sorry about that. Sorry about the technical difficulty. <clears throat> My name is Michael Madden. Um, I am the program coordinator for the Orthotic and Prosthetic Technology Program at Bluegrass Community and Technical College. Um, I am a, I know this is a little bit of a variant from what we've been covering before, but I am a 57 year cancer survivor, which is how I first was introduced into the prosthetic profession. When we talk about orthotics and prosthetics, orthotics is a science that deals with the mechanical devices that support or supplement a weakened or abnormal body part. And that can be anything from a knee brace to a cranial remolding helmet for in, uh, infants, to scoliosis modules for patients with scoliosis. Now, prosthetics is the branch of medicine that deals with the production and application of artificial body parts. We teach both those aspects of this particular science here, both orthotics and prosthetics. And orthotics and prosthetics has a very long history. The first prosthetics was actually the, uh, found in an Egyptian mummy where the replacement feet but we really started to become more of an industry in the 1800s, where it was a very specialized um, field, if you will. You had to be kind of an apprentice, work your way through that apprenticeship, and then eventually you could become an orthotist or a prosthetist and work with patients. But we have come a long way since the initiation of orthotics and prosthetics. And even in the late 1920s and 30s, we were still using the old wooden artificial limb. Um, what a lot of people don't appreciate is the fact that computers weren't around forever. And what you see here is the original NASA calculation board. When they first started sending people into orbit and started sending people to the moon, a lot of that work was done by hand. And it's only recent that we've gone into computer technology and that has gone into the orthotic and prosthetic pref uh, profession as well. And typically when we talk about orthotics and prosthetics, there's three basic areas that we go into when we come into the profession. And that's either into research, clinical, or technical. And what we teach here is the technical aspects of orthotics and prosthetics. 
So the research side is where a lot of the design going into things like robotics, exoskeletal systems, a lot of that is still in the research uh, phase. Uh, osseo integration, where we're actually implanting prostheses into bones themselves, uh, that would be the research side. And here you can see somebody walking up the stairs with an exoskeletal system. Obviously you have somebody who's paralyzed. That's an incredible asset to them to be able to be up and be mobile. And then you can see someone with a prosthesis that's neurally integrated. So basically he has his nervous system tapped into the prosthesis so that when he thinks about emotion, that prosthesis will move. What most people go into is the clinical aspect. And that's where we actually take these technologies and use them and apply them to systems for patients to use. There's a lot of anatomy and biomechanics, a lot of biology on the clinical side, um, because obviously we're dealing with a human being and fitting either an orthosis, a brace, or a prosthesis, an artificial limb to the human body. What we teach is the technical side. That's the second most um, area or the second largest area that people will go into with orthotics and prosthetics. So we start by taking impressions of a body part, we take those impressions and we make them into molds. So we start with a model fabrication. Sometimes we'll work with plaster. Other times what we do is we use imaging that we'll talk about in a little bit. We teach different types of plastic fabrication. Here we see a thermal forming plastic, which is a sheet plastic that we mold to a particular body part to get an orthosis or a brace. We teach thermal setting plastics where we use resins. We introduce them into materials such as carbon graphite, basalt fibers, fiberglass, and then we produce a plastic from that. We also teach textile fabrications where we teach people how to make straps and various strapping systems that are used in conjunction with an orthosis or a prosthesis. And then we teach the assembly and alignment. Our bodies are aligned in a very specific way. And we try to match and mimic those alignments when we're building our orthotic and prosthetic systems. So it's important we understand biomechanics, we understand how the body functions, how it's aligned, motion, um, and obviously that ties into the anatomy pretty specifically. What we've moved into, like most professions have moved into, is using computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, or CAD CAM. So we're using white light scanners and other types of scanners to take a 3D image. We then take that 3D image or that STL file, we import it into a CAD program where we can now manipulate this object within the CAD program. So instead of working on a plaster model, and taking plaster away and adding plaster, we can do all that type of, uh, of changes within the CAD program itself. And once we have it all adjusted in the CAD program the way we want, we can then use computer-aided manufacturing types of 3D printers. Here you see a fusion deposition model printing. Uh, we're doing a lot with uh, laser sintering printing as well. So this is where the industry and the profession is and is going in the future. And we teach that here at BCTC. We teach the old method of the plaster and, and working those hand skills. And we're teaching the CAD CAM and the newer technologies that the industry is using, that the profession is using. And a little bit of fun, we, um, we have some fun sometimes. Here you can see some animal prostheses. On this dog, you see that orange leg in the back that was actually designed in a CAD program and 3D printed. And here you can see, oh, we'll go back again. We can see the dog again. And you can see the dog really, and it's the, the tan dog that's wearing the prosthesis. This dog gets around pretty well. And that again was all designed in CAD and then printed out in a 3D printer and fit to the dog for the dog to be able to use. And the dog gets along quite well. So we get to have a, a lot of fun with this. And animal prosthetics and animal orthotics is actually becoming a niche within the orthotic and prosthetic profession.
And here we can see a, another dog. This dog we uh, also did, and we did some traditional manufacturing with this, and we did some CAD CAM and 3D printing with this as well. But you notice the previous dog, it was the back leg. On this dog, it's the front leg. So the designs had to be very, very different because on a dog, the back legs and the front legs actually do, they act very different. So we had to adjust our design based on what that particular limb was doing. And this is really why we do what we do. It's taking people and helping them rebuild their lives after a traumatic injury or, or maybe a birth defect. What we do is we try to restore people back to function, to give them lives where they can participate in the activities they love and, and be able to live a healthy and full life. Now, the Orthotic and Prosthetic Technology Program at Bluegrass Community and Technical College is part of the Work Ready Kentucky Scholarship Program. And what that means is that there is a scholarship out there that after your federal financial aid, if you apply and are accepted for the scholarship program, they'll pick up the balance of your tuition and fees. So that basically you can graduate from this course, from this program, which is an associate of applied science program, and you can be relatively debt-free when you uh, graduate. And that's a real great asset when you're going out and beginning your career. And I'll stick around for any questions if anybody has any. Uh, you can find us on the BCTC website under the Orthotic and Prosthetic Technology Program. And we would love to have a conversation with you if you're interested in the orthotics and prosthetics as a career. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate that. That was great information. Those videos of the dogs, that was super cool. So thanks for all the work that you do. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week on May 4th from Next Era Energy, learning about careers in sustainable energy. So we will see you all then. Thanks everyone.